joining me now is City Council Member Jamani Williams, who represents the 45th Council District, which includes parts of Brooklyn. Council Member Williams also ran for Lieutenant Governor last year, and he will be on the Public Advocate Special Election ballot line under It's Time, Let's Go. So, thank you for being here. Thanks Welcome. For me. Good to see you again. So, before we get into your candidacy for Public Advocate, highlight for viewers a little bit of what you see as your main accomplishments to this point in your public service career. Well, my, my biggest accomplishment to me is that I believe I've been able to maintain my activist status and as an elected official. It's been critically important to me because when I came in, I was told I had to choose between both of those. And I said, no, you don't. And I was kind of in vogue to be an activist. But when I came in, it, people considered it a liability. And I wanted to show that you can be productive in both. So whether it was being ranked the most productive council member in the general body of 50, or, or being able to pass 53 pieces of legislation, having a large uh, voice in the policy discussions around the abuse of the stop, question of risk, around ban the box, even how we address gun violence at this point. Um, there's a whole host of issues that I'm so proud to have been a part of. Uh, jobs for young people. Uh, one of the mo uh, previous landmark bills that just passed, the 52nd one, had to deal with uh, women's reproductive rights. Uh, these are critical issues. And I'm just proud that I was able to put my body on the line when necessary and still get back and be able to do the work. I've been able to show courage, uh, whether it's the mayor or the, the governor or the speaker of my own body, which some people won't even do. I've been able to hold strong, and that's because I've consistently put people before the seat that I hold. So activism, legislating, you're out in the street protesting, as you say, put your body on the line. You're also crafting legislation and pushing that through. Sometimes you're one of the lone no votes in the council or you're abstaining on bills where you have some issues you don't want to give your approval to. Now you want to be in more of an executive position. So I'll play that sort of devil's advocate role of the people who doubted you coming into the council. Are you ready to be in charge of an office like that and run the public advocate's office? Is that something you feel like you can make that jump? Well, you know, when I ran for lieutenant governor, and I thank everyone out there uh, who came out, New York City came out strong for me, um, I said I actually wanted to turn that position into the public advocate's office of the state. So this has been a position that I thought was powerful for a long time. And I thought the state, I still think it actually, the state needs a position like that. And so if there, if there was ever a descriptive role for what I've been trying to do on the council, uh, the public advocate is probably it. So the answer is 100% yes. Okay, so what does a, what does a Jamani Williams as public advocate look like? What, is, what are your priorities? How do you run the office? You know, what do you want voters to understand? If you elect me to this citywide position, here's what I'm going to do with it. Well, first, people should understand what the public advocate office is. I don't think a lot of people do, including some of the people who are running. And so uh, it was crafted in around 1989. Uh, Mark Green, the first public advocate, we're happy to have his endorsement as well. They gave it five functions after they said they wanted the position primarily to rise above politics, make decisions on what was best for the people, not for themselves. The first was they can introduce legislation into the city council. Uh, they act as an ombudsman, a watchdog over the council, the mayor, a go-between between people and government. The third was a charter cop. I actually want to spend a lot of time on the charter cop position. Uh, the public advocate is the person who ensures that agencies are doing the job they're supposed to do, mandated by the city charter. And the last two are important as well. You have a vote on the pension board to make sure we're investing or not investing uh, in retirees, uh, 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 cities' uh, investments properly. And the last one, you have important appointments. Uh, mm -hmm. to things like the P City Planning Commission, which is very critically important in land. I want to continue working on the things that are happening. The number one issue is deeply income-targeted affordable housing, uh, whether it is rent regulation coming up, whether it's NYCHA, uh, whether it's zoning. Uh, MIH, I'm calling for a, a moratorium to rezonings in the city uh, for the most part. Uh, we're asking for a racial impact study to be included before every rezoning. I'm one of the lone people who voted against my age and routinely vote against rezonings that don't have enough affordability. The uh, transparency and accountability in government from Amazon to policing, uh, criminal justice issues that I've continued to uh, champion, and of course, hashtag Cuomo's MTA and the transportation in general across the city. So let's talk a little more about the housing issue. I'm not sure. going to go into all the weeds of MIH, as you say, mandatory inclusionary housing. If folks viewing want to know more about that, Google, look it up. There's a lot of reading to do. We don't have time to go into all the details now. But this is a program to mandate that if developers are getting more room to build more housing, they can do a lot of market rate, but they have to build some affordable units. You feel like it didn't go far enough. You have criticized Mayor de Blasio's approach to zoning and housing. 
is it your belief that the mayor's affordable housing plan basically needs to be rewritten to focus on the lowest income individuals, people coming out of homelessness? How, how would you say, here's where this housing plan needs to go? Not just it's not good enough, where does it need to go? Well, it's interesting, from the beginning, uh, folks like me and others were pushing and saying the original plan wasn't good enough. We're, we're glad that they updated it and, and increased the numbers, uh, but still, we are not targeting enough of the lower income. So everybody needs assistance in this city. So we can't forget about the middle class either, the teacher who's married to the police officer. But the higher up you go, the more vacancy you have. And so we have to be attacking the lack of vacancy at the bottom, and right now we aren't. And so what people will say, oh, well, MIH was better than anything we have in the country, better than it was before. That's true, but we're, we're, we're gauging it without any context. Uh, the question is, what did you have the power to do and not do? And we had the power to ensure deep, targeted income, uh, house, uh, income targeted housing in every one of the options, and we just didn't do that. And that's because the mayor put forth uh, a faulty le piece of legislation, and we didn't have the strength at the time in the council's leadership to push back on that. And so most people know now what I and others knew then, that we just had to do so much. So there's patchwork going on. I was proud when I was a housing and buildings chair. We forced the administration to admit that they needed to do some things, which they have. They've been overlaying, uh, but it's still not enough. When it comes to homelessness, um, we just have to make sure we know who we're talking about. The vast majority of people are working poor, uh, or working, and not even poor. They just don't have enough. Uh, so that's one set, right? They have to be able to afford what the, the there's another set that has domestic violence issues uh, or substance abuse issues. There's another smaller set that most people think of uh, when they see street homeless, and that is some have mental health issues. So we have to make sure which set that we're talking about because that needs different set of uh, prescriptions. And the mayor says, I have a 300,000 unit plan. It is balanced, but we are devoting more units to the lower end than we are to the, to the upper end of the spectrum that's included, you know, the upper end being middle class uh, folks. And you're saying 300,000 units, we don't even need that number. Let's reduce that number and really go deeper with the money that we have. Or are you saying, let's keep 300,000 units, but let's Target it lower and devote even more funding towards the subsidies. I mean, it's, it's got to go one, yeah. one No, well, way, I, right? I don't mind even increasing them. I don't mind shooting for the stars and landing on the moon. But now we're not even shooting for the moon, and that's what the problem is. So let's increase the numbers, but what we have to do with whatever number is there, we have to tailor make more to the low income, and that cost, that does cost mm -hmm. subsidies. So we have to have the dealers, I'm sorry, the, um, the developers uh, and the city together, everybody deciding that. Some of the profit has to be social impact. It can't be just every single penny that we can squeeze out of it. And from finally, they, they, we did get some folks listening to us, and so they did change the plan, but it simply doesn't go far enough. And we are now subsidizing market rate housing. That's not even the middle class. That's just upper echelon. That doesn't make any sense. And we have to have bold vision in this city because everybody looks at this city. So whatever we do here, people are going to do across the nation. And but as you said here. on MAH, on mandatory inclusion of housing, your colleagues in the council who voted for it, including Brad Lander, who you're very close with, this was you know really a pet issue for him. Celebrating this as the first in the country to do it, he's endorsed your your candidacy very yet proud. again. Uh, but even even he's misguided, not not going far enough. I mean, this was something where people said, you know, this is this is visionary, and you're saying, not not you quite. Know. Even friends differ. I, yeah. I'm very proud to have his endorsement. We're on 99.9% .9 of issues uh, the same. What happened here really was that the speaker at the time uh, did not put the political pressure needed to push a better deal. And so right now what happens is we have three options. Only one of them, only one, goes to deep income and targeted affordability. And by the way, it's even not enough. Uh, but the other two don't. And so many people choose the other two, and we do nothing. And we just continue to segregate a city that we have. We have to have real leadership on these issues, and we have to take political risks, and we just did not do that. Yes, it is better than a country, but that shows you how bad the rest of the country is. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it shows you how well we did, particularly with the crisis we're in right now. So you referenced former City Council Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito, one of your top competitors for this position of public advocate. Do you see yourself as the front runner in this race? A lot of people talk about you as such, or at least in the top group, because you just ran a very strong lieutenant governor campaign, got a lot of votes in the city. Now folks are coming back for the special election, and you were one of the most recent people on the ballot who a lot of people in New York City did support. 
Is that how you think of yourself, that you're the person to beat in this race? Absolutely not. Uh, there are a lot of candidates uh, who are on, uh, on the ballot. A lot of people have some great ideas. Uh, I will be running terrified until 9 one on election day. But here's what I do know from the last election, that I was told I had to choose uh, a different message. My message didn't work. We showed that it actually does work. Uh, we know that people consciously came out and voted for me. You can tell on the ballot, particularly in New York City, they voted for the governor. They did not vote for his choice for lieutenant governor. They went back and voted for his choice for AG. That's a powerful message and it was very humbling. So at least we start off with a subset of people who at least we know uh, agree with the message. I have to know, I have to now go back and re-earn every single vote. Uh, we have a campaign plan that I think can do that and I, I believe we're executing that. So uh, I think we have a great plan and we'll be victorious on election day. But I'm, I'm running terrified. Like, I'm in last place and I'm going to do that till 9 one election day. So a couple other issues I want to hit on in our last few minutes. Uh, housing and policing probably are, are your top Two biggest issues that you focused on—is that fair to say in your in your city council? Yeah, I guess so. In my, in my there's, 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 there's more issues, but those are the two uh, most. Associated so on with. on policing, let's say you come into the public advocate's office February 27th after the special election on the 26th. Is there a focus area for you on police reform? And are you uh, do you have any response to folks who say we don't need Jamani Williams coming into the citywide office and pushing us even further in the direction of of police reform than the mayor has already gone? Uh, transparency and accountability are the two buckets that we have not done better on. We're in a much better place than we were thanks to this administration, thanks to advocates. Uh, it was a low bar to begin with, but we are better, except for two areas, transparency and accountability. Mayor Giuliani fired the officer that killed Anthony Byers because he used an illegal chokehold. Daniel Pantaleo is making more money now than before he killed Eric Garner. That's this administration. I'm proud to have uh, the mother of Anthony Byers, Iris Byers, uh, to endorsing our campaign as well as many others because I'm pragmatic about this. But we're, we all know that there are places we have to continue to move forward. Those conversations are never easy and they will be never e easy. When we dealt with the abuse of stop, question, and frisk, they told us the sky would crack open, the city would burn to the ground if we didn't do it. We said people have a right to safer, uh, better, uh, better policing and safer streets, and we got that. It takes courage to have the conversations. Now everybody knows the abuses of stop, question, and frisk were wrong, uh, but it takes courage to have those conversations. So we need to continue the conversation that policing just can't be equated with public safety, that there's a whole bunch of pillars connected to that. Policing is, a, is an important one, particularly for acute problems. But we keep sending acute solutions to complex problems. And that's an important conversation we have to have. If you go to uh, the hospital and only stay in triage, and you don't get to the back with all the good stuff and all the machines and all the expert doctors, you never get better. And that's what's been happening in some of our communities. It's actually unfair to the police officer who risk their lives and want to do a good job but don't have all the tools that other agencies have. And it's unfair to the community. So that conversation is going well. I'm glad that uh, the commission is recently saying he's going to receive some of the recommendations made from a recent panel. I was glad to speak to that panel. It's things we've been talking about for a very long time. But if you don't have someone, this is policing has to be a constant conversation uh, going forward, constantly talking to the community to see what they need. And you have to have, so, have someone who has the courage of doing that. And I'm glad that I only have the courage, I now have the experience needed to lead a conversation like that in a pragmatic way. A couple minutes left. Hit on something else that voters should know, something you'll be pushing, a policy you'll be pushing. You named, of course, that the public advocate can introduce legislation still. So you, as a city council member, you've been able to do that. As public advocate, you've been able to do that. What are a couple of the things you want voters to know that you would pursue or introduce if you're elected? There's a few things going on. One, we have to go back to housing because rent regulation is up in the state. Uh, and we have to make sure that our friends in the, in the state legislature uh, continue to hold may, uh, the governor accountable. And we have to get the strongest rent laws that, that we can. Um, there are people losing their homes to foreclosure. Uh, there was a program called third party transfer uh, where the city accidentally stole people's homes. And I've asked for, I have a bill asking for a moratorium on that until we figure this out. I also, as I mentioned, have a moratorium bill and uh, ask for uh, the racial impact study before any um, uh, rezonings go for it. Of a we neighborhood. Have, of a neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a, a bill now uh, with actually Councilmember Brad Lander and Councilmember Jimmy Van Bramer to say that a mayor can never again sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, uh, when uh, working on a deal like we saw on Amazon. And those are critical things that have to happen now. And that uh, is going to be uh, before the election in June. And so uh, right after we, we make sure we have a staff 
that's reflective of the diversity of the city, we're going to get in and start working on some of those issues. Right. So as you mentioned, and we'll just say this in closing, you, the special election is February 26th. Then there's a normal election cycle. But now the primary has been moved up to June. There'll be a primary in June if the winner is challenged uh, in the primary, and then a, a general election in November. Let's say you are victorious in those. Am I correct in saying you've committed that you won't be running for mayor in the in the following election cycle, 2021, or are you not ruling that out? I am definitely ruling that out. Okay. Uh, and I know folks who know me, when I, when I say things, I mean it. I am not running for mayor in 2021. I have no desire to uh, run for mayor actually at all. It's not what I'm trying to do. Uh, I think this position very much fits me. Uh, this is, I can't say I'm a perfect person, but this is a perfect position for me and people will see my background and, and can research what I've done uh, and they will know very much so uh, this is the type of person you want, someone who's going to, who understands I didn't get elected to get reelected. I didn't even get elected to become public advocate. I got elected to do a job. I hope doing that job that will let that happen, but uh, it may not. Let's, say, let's go out on this note. You said you're not a perfect person. What's one mistake you've made in, in public life that you've learned from? You know, I think some of my comments uh, around uh, marriage equality and uh, on abortion issues, I've allowed them to be mis misconstrued, and so I've apologized for those. And uh, since then, I've made it abundantly clear that I 100% support a woman's right to access safe legal abortions, end of story, and 100% support marriage equality. End of story. Uh, and I wish I'd handled some of those questions differently. And I, and I apologize particularly to the LGBT community, where otherwise I have been an, an awesome ally on so many of those issues. And it's critically important. Lots more to discuss, but we have to leave it there. Jamani Williams, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. All right, good luck.